Yo, what's going on everybody? It's your boy Naruto to explain here and I gotta say man episode one of the Magina Bandits arc is finally here and I know for myself, I can't speak for everybody, but I know for myself I'm really glad that we're now starting to get some story that has some substance to it, okay? Like you guys know like I understand the purpose of the transition episodes, I'm not the biggest fan of them, but I like when they're done correctly, but for the most part I'm not the biggest fan of them. So getting to content like this is highly enjoyable so a little bit of a news update for some of you guys so we get into the review is this arc is confirmed to be at least 11 episodes because the writer who handled the first part of the Magina Bandits arc recently said on Twitter that the first act is gonna be seven episodes and the second act is gonna be four so we at least got 11 episodes to have this arc done now I personally like this length of time simply for the fact that based on the first episode here they're doing something very ambitious so what they're attempting to do is they're attempting to shoehorn in a bunch of world building by telling us what goes on with the land of grass and with Hozuki Castle and building up the Magina Bandits and fleshing out that whole backstory. But they're also attempting to rely on conflict without necessarily having to rely on melodrama, which is something that the Borzo series has for the most part done outside of the slice of life stuff. They've relied on melodrama a little bit. So I like the fact that they're trying to beef things up that way and then with the pacing with the way everything's going so far in this arc is they're going to be using conflict in other ways than just people punching each other in the face so this is going to be interesting to see how they walk this very delicate line but i gotta say so i did like the whole thing of seeing how the prisoners are transported to hozuki castle i thought that that was really interesting they mixed in some of the lore for this like if you look the ship that boruto and them are on is traveling by sea which is consistent with the information that you got in the blood prison movie but the other thing is is they're mixing in lore from the kakashi heden novel which is blood prison is controlled by the land of grass so they're mixing in lore here i mean and for the most part i mean i'm okay with the revelation that you've got the leader hozuki castle being mujo which is you look at his design and everything he's basically a boruto version of the character move from the blood prison movie so that was kind of cool to kind of see that the same thing with the celestial prison jutsu i like the weakness that they gave to it because if you guys saw the movie and if you look at what they were stating in the Kakashi Hiden novel that jutsu was an absolute deal breaker if you got outside of the parameters that jutsu that jutsu could absolutely incinerate you so in this one it just puts you in excruciating pain like Naruto had a little moment where he's running around with it and you see like the flames kind of popping up on his chest but it was something like can you actually endure it and in some cases people popped up in the flames so it's kind of toned it down a little bit I was a little disappointed in that but again you have to look at the time slot for where Boruto's airing so that's part of the reason why they're not going a hundred percent hardcore with it because Boruto does not run during prime time during the weekday like Naruto and Naruto Shippuden did so I'm okay with that aspect there I also like the fact that even before we find out that Mujo put a fake celestial prison jutsu on Boruto and on Miski what you see is like if you pay close attention how all the other prisoners have the jutsu placed on them there's a difference in the animation when it's placed on Boruto in particular so I like the fact that they were telegraphing the fact that things aren't necessarily what you see so another thing this episode does is you know it gives some peace of mind to a very vocal minority of fans out there in the community who say oh well team seven is way too skilled way too talented you know why aren't any of them tuning and also acknowledges that the team of tuning that they had selected for this mission were unable to carry it out but he says like look you know you guys are already tuning level in terms of skill so now what i also like is how they use flashbacks as a way to give us some more exposition so instead of starting us off in the hidden leaf village and seeing everything navigate they want a different approach now you guys know i'm a huge fan of in medias rate which is simply taking a scene and starting the story when you're already at the midway point so if this would have been done like a typical boruto arc we would have seen team seven in their everyday life and then they would have got sent to the hokage office and then they would have been briefed and then it would have been dispatched on to the mission that's typically how these arcs tend to go with in medias ray you basically start at the uh, middle portion of an act and you just tell the story from there and you use other writing elements to catch the reader up so in this case they're doing with the viewer and so you're getting caught up via all of these flashbacks with naruto and different segments of the episode is revealing information and as the flashbacks are really occurring 
occurring it's one of those things where because it's being told from boruto's perspective you see boruto recalling the information as it's relevant to his mission so i thought that that was really interesting i also like the whole revelation with kokiri where naruto says like hey part of your mission is going to be finding out the truth can this guy be trusted and we get the whole revelation that kokiri he stole money from the magina bandits and he kind of went under the radar but he got himself sent to prison and so what ends up happening is the number two man in the magina bandits gets sent to the prison as well so the thing with that is it's like that's clearly a hit like kokiri has that right that's clearly a hit and when you get in prison and everything you know you got like the different gang relationships and all that other stuff so i like the fact that they're incorporating some stuff that could happen in the real world there but what i will say what i will say on this is that i like the fact that you know sai and shikamaru are there given the brief and you can tell that they've done a lot of prep work with boruto and the others i know there's gonna be somebody typing well why are boruto and mitsuki going in prison why is nobody batting an eye if this is supposed to be a supermax facility for uh prisoners is this supposed to be a and that's another thing that they changed this is no longer a supermax facility this is just a prison for shinobi but to the people that have that issue i would say this okay so when you look at boruto and mitsuki they're 13 years old in this world of naruto 13 year olds like kakashi stated in the very first arc of the series i think a lot of people tend to forget this is kakashi stated there are children your age and younger who are more skilled than me when kakashi said that to naruto kakashi also said that some children your age are cold-blooded killers and so when you look at this right here you can't judge a book by its cover so having 13 year olds show up in a prison that's not something out the ordinary you do have children like itachi who would play hide the kunai with his family during a family picnic so i mean it's one of those things where you don't know whether or not these kids pulled out in uchiha massacre you don't know whether or not during that robbery things turn sideways you don't know what they've done before getting popped for robbery so having them in a prison is not as odd as you might think now the other thing i like on this is how they're retelling part of blood prison but they're taking new liberties and i i see this episode and it really gives me hope that we will eventually get a sasuke resident adaptation which has sasuke and sakura undercover at a prison because they're barring some of the elements from that novel where you have somebody on the team pretending to be a prisoner and then on the other side you have someone who's pretending to be a outside party being transferred in in the case with sarda she's pretending to be a journalism student and it allows her to gather information so essentially they're doing the same thing sasuke and sakura did which is once looking for information on the inside the other one's trying to work their way from the outside in so i thought that that was pretty cool i like a little jail sequence where boruto essentially is in the process of getting punked by one of his teammates and mitsuki takes up for boruto so essentially boruto's like that little whiny bitch that needs the protection <laughs> like boruto's the one like he's like oh okay okay hey, he's gonna take care of me like so i like what you got there with mitsuki also like how they found out a little bit of information about how you have this plant that grows outside of the actual prison and most of them are for the most part not poisonous but there are a few strains of it that are poisonous and you have to look for the difference one's white one's rose so i like that bit there the one uh issue i would take with it is the fact that you know boruto's a little too trusting and i like the fact that you know even the prisoner states like i'm not responsible for anything that happened to you so it just opens up the door for a possibility that you know those cellmates aren't necessarily who boruto and mitsuki actually believe them to be so i thought that that was pretty interesting right there that you had that moment where boruto's taken over to the medical ward and you find out the difference between the medical ward and the actual prison i thought that that was a nice bit of conflict that's added there because you see the setup you see the difference between the guard as well between the medic so i like seeing that little element there i like the fact that mujo is keeping surveillance on boruto as well as keeping surveillance on sarda and having little small moments where you can actually talk to sarda i mean that's cool that's cool i i like that right there like they're, they're taking a very delicate approach to actually telling the story because when you get to episodes like this and a battle shown in that it isn't necessarily filled with a lot of action it's going to be all these small details that are going to allow the conflict to be told in a way that keeps the viewer engaged because i don't know about you but once we got to the end of the episode you know i was like damn i wanted more 
like what's gonna happen next like that's a good way to tell a story so i like that little bit right there i i really like that because it's just showing you that this is a delicate mission i also like the fact that again team seven they're getting their acknowledgement of being you know tuning level and this would be a really good way for sarda in particular to overcome the mishap that she was kind of branded with over the miski desertion arc so i thought that this was really good this is another opportunity for redemption when you really look at it sarda's got the most important role on that team because she's running recon if you will she's gathering information and eventually she's got to pass it on the board so so i thought that, that was really cool just to see that element right there now when it comes to how they might be proceeding in the future with this i think that there's also some foreshadowing kind of built in there so we do know for a fact that there's a beef between the guard and between the lead medic we also have some clues where basically the head of that security is talking about how yeah even though uh hozuki castle is having its leadership passed down via the clan and the person that masters that jutsu becomes the new leader of hozuki castle you know he throws some shade at him he throws some shade at mujo and he says like look you know he's just a little bit too soft so it's showing that there might be a potential betrayal there you know it would make a lot of sense because again you know information is passed down to the number two man of the magina bandits so, i mean it is i'm not saying whether or not that's going to be him but i'm saying they're setting up potential misdirection they're also setting up potential conflict there i mean they're doing a bunch of different things in this episode so what i want to know from you guys is how do you feel about this part of the arc being seven episodes how do you think that this could be used to better flesh out the magina bandits as we get the build up towards the second act which i i totally believe that the second act might very well be the last part i don't think there's going to be an act three when it comes to this arc because those of you who read the magina bandits in the board so manga know that this is only really three chapters and if you just kind of look at it i mean four episodes is enough to cover the information that's going to be in those three chapters so i mean i thought that this was pretty cool but let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below but as always guys if you like anything i had to say don't forget to comment rate subscribe and share thank you so much for watching to the end have an awesome day guys guys.